This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. The biblical feasts are like that. They're supposed to make you anticipate what is coming so that you never forget. Each feast is biblically prophetic. Every feast featured a major event in Jesus' life. Every major event of Jesus' life happened during one of the feasts. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Hello, my name is Bill and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. As we lead up to Easter, we're excited to bring you this series called Eat and Remember. In today's message, Pastor Jeff is speaking about the importance of gathering around the family table and the deeper meaning behind gathering like this. Let's begin this journey with Pastor Jeff, reading from Revelation 6 and Revelation chapter 16. Okay, if you have a Bible with you or your iPad, your iPhone, whatever, two passages, believe it or not, Revelation 6 and Revelation 16. So if you can find it, kind of find those in your Bible, on your phone, whatever, on your iPad, turn the ringer off, Revelation 6, Revelation 16. Hey, do you remember a time when we used to sit around the table and eat with each other in our homes? Anybody remember that? You remember that? This used to happen. This is a real thing. I'm not making this up. People actually used to sit around the table. This is almost every night of the week, but we always did it on Sunday afternoon, right? That's one of the things I really love about the Hispanic culture. They still do this a lot. We can learn a lot from them, the the extended family thing, but you sit around the table. This was now, this was before or BF, before Facebook (laughs) or before Snapchat or before all the narcissism that we're in now, but that's why, they, that's why they call them selfies, right? Because you can't spell narcissism. But we used to sit around the table, to sit around the table. You remember that? And we would eat together. In my home, you had my father at the end of the table, my mother to his left-hand side, three brothers all the way around. And then you didn't eat in the evening. And this was probably at least four out of seven evenings. And definitely on Sunday afternoon, you didn't eat until dad read the Bible and had a prayer of thanksgiving for all that had been provided. And we were thankful for the pinto beans and cornbread that we grew up on. And then after the prayer and devotion and thanksgiving for the meal, then we'd go around and we'd talk about our challenges at school and our successes, what we were able to achieve at school. And you did not get up from that table until dad dismissed you. Oh man, you got up from that table before you dismissed? Oh, it's the woodshed. At times, and you know, our family had no money, so vacation to us was not Hawaii or Florida. It was getting in the car and taking a big cooler of Pepsi and bologna sandwiches and driving up into the mountains, a place called Mountain City, to look at the rhododendrons. They were flowers. And we would have picnics. We would play wiffle ball. We would uh, eat uh, homemade peach ice cream. Uh, the, the nature of glory divine. Remember that? This is the future. The symbolism of what is to come. And we would talk about the things that are important to us. I mean, we'd have pretty deep conversations, meaningful questions. And we'd sit around on that blanket as sun would set. And after we'd had our picnic, and we'd look at the stars. We'd talk to each other. We'd love each other. We'd fight each other. And on the way home, we'd say to ourselves, man, that was so nice, let's do it again sometime. But most of growing up, what you remember is those times around the table and the eating together, whatever it was, and the talking and the conversation. Breakdown of the American family has a lot to do with no more dinner times. Do you know that that's exactly what God meant for us to do? To celebrate and to feast together Because he knew it would be in those times that we would remember what God did in the past and we would keep our attention focused on what he was going to do in the future. In the Bible, anytime anytime the Bible expresses joy and vitality, it always talks about feasting. Let me give you an example. This is in Revelation 19. 
Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come. And then verse nine, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. So in the Bible, now listen, this is important because we've lost this and because we've lost it, we've lost something crucial. And the only way we're going to get back is to restore it in the Bible. There was a direct correlation between eating together and remembering together what God had done in the past, celebrating together all of those things and anticipating what God was going to be doing in the future. Now, you and I this weekend, and I told someone backstage, I said, my head is hurting. Now, is your head hurting yet? You're thinking, is he going to cover all that? Oh, there's more. Wait, there's more. We're going to begin a journey this weekend that I promise you that if you'll lean into this and commit it is going to be the most extravagant, most joyful Easter that you have ever experienced. But if you just show up on Easter and miss all of these things that we're going to do working up to Easter, this whole series is to culminate on Easter weekend. There are seven biblical feasts of remembrance that are supremely significant. It's like God said to his people, and you think he doesn't say it to us, he does. He says to his people... I'm going to give give you specific instructions about the food you are to eat, when you're to eat it, and I'm even going to give you the utensils, and I'm going to tell you what each of them represent. And he says to his people, make sure that you never stop celebrating these feasts, because if you do, you'll be prone to wander away from me. And then you'll be back in the wilderness, enslaved, rejected. These times of remembrance... I want you to celebrate for the rest of your life. Now, not only that, listen, what if I told you that the feast or the feasts of God lay out a plan for mankind from the very beginning? So if, listen, if you know the meaning and the timing of the feasts, you know the meaning and the timing of his return. In fact, the feasts will completely model for us the mission, the sequence, and the significance of Jesus' redemptive work. The mission, what Jesus came to do, the sequence, at what point in history will he do it, and the significance, what is its deeper meaning. In fact, and this is going to surprise a lot of you, they even present to you, if you understand the timing of the feasts, you can understand the season in which Jesus will return, the parousia. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jeff, I've heard you say numerous times, nobody knows the day or the hour. No, I didn't say that, Jesus said that. But Jesus also gave us the illustration of the fig tree, which means that you and I are supposed to be looking for the signs. And you can't see the signs unless you have put disciplines into your life that will help you remember what the Lord has done in the past and anticipate what he's going to do in the future. You know, the feast, these feasts are like vacation photos. Okay. Have you ever gone on vacation, but before you go, it's going to be a few months. So you start looking at photos on Google of where you're going to be going. And even before you go, you enjoy it. Man, I'm going to be there. Man, I'm going to be there. So I get to go to Greece later on this year because they don't care about any of that COVID stuff. So I get to go to Greece. And I've already been on Google Earth, Google World, Google everything, and I've been finding, okay, where are the golf courses in Greece? Forget about the biblical sites. Where are the golf courses? And I'm already enjoying my vacation even though I'm, I'm not even there yet. Never been. The biblical feasts are like that. They're supposed to make you anticipate what is coming so that you never forget. And one more thing, by the way. Each feast is biblically prophetic. Every feast featured a major event in Jesus' life. Let's say it the other way. Every major event of Jesus' life happened during one of the feasts. And so, if that's true... We should expect his return and his subsequent rule to occur during the last feasts. There should be a pattern. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a 40,000-foot view of the feasts. Don't worry. We're going to go through this fast. Just to give you the... Oh, Now, there's so much to say, and I'll be tempted along the way to stop and try to explain everything, and if we do that, we're going to be here till midnight. You don't want that, do you? I don't want that, and you don't want that. So just remember, if you have any question, oh, all he's doing right now is he's giving me the overview. There are seven biblical feasts. There are the spring feasts. There's Pesach, 
And it's pronounced different ways. Let's go with that. That's the Passover with which most of you are familiar. The whole thing about the feast, everything that's laid out on the table is to represent the redemption God gave the children of Israel in bondage, delivering them out of Egypt. It's liberation from Egypt. But you'll notice that every feast, listen carefully, every feast is celebrated by the Hebrews and then it's somehow fulfilled in Christ and then it's somehow fulfilled in the future. So you've got the Passover that is fulfilled among the Old Testament Hebrews, but the Passover is also going to be fulfilled by who? Jesus. Now, if you notice, this whole thing about Passover is about darkness coming over the land of Egypt. The death angel is coming over. Judgment is coming on Egypt. But if judgment comes, it doesn't only strike Egypt, it, it strikes everyone. Just because you're the people of God doesn't mean that you're immune to judgment. So God says, look, I am coming as judge. And the only way you're going to be safe is to take an unblemished lamb. This is a contract God made with his people. Take an unblemished lamb. You're going to slay that lamb. You're going to put the blood over the doorpost. When Jesus comes, he's going to slay the Passover lamb, which is Christ, and you're going to put the blood over the post of the cross. The death angel then passes by. The judgment angel passes by. In the past, he passes over the people, Pesach. In the future, the lamb of God. But is there a future Passover or Pesach? Matzah is the second feast. Now, this happens the 14th day of the first month of Nisan. The second feast happens, you notice, on the 15th day. Well, that's two straight days of feasting. You got it. Matzah is the feast of unleavened bread. Now, the people, and we'll get into this, the people were supposed to, uh, uh, to prepare their bread. There, no leaven, because leaven represented in the Hebrew mind a, a sort of contamination, a, a sort of sinful uh, activity. And so when they celebrated matzah, they were thanking God for his redemption, their salvation, and now because of the salvation, God was going to sanctify them. And so he was going to take them out of Egypt, and as they came out of Egypt, God needed the wilderness to rid them of all the contamination that they discovered in, in Egypt. So the wilderness is not a bad thing in that God was preparing them for the promised land. You need the wilderness in order to be prepared for the promised land. So just keep that in mind. A lot of the difficulties you face in your life aren't that God is opposed to you or that God's abandoned you. It's he's preparing you for the promised land. No leaven, no sin, corruption, decay. And there's also this connection that I don't fully understand yet between sanctification, the lack of contamination, and the purity that Christ will bring in the past as he cleanses them through the process, through the Feast of Matzah, and in the future, Christ is going to, to cleanse the temple, and he's going to cleanse the church, and he's going to cleanse you and me from the inside out, which leads us then, and this is why these three are celebrated within a matter of days, leads us to the third feast, which is uh, Bikurim. Now, where this is sanctification, and this is redemption, this is provision. So when you involve yourself in the feast of Bikurim, you are so grateful now for what God has provided and you acknowledge his provision through the Feast of First Fruits. Part of the celebration of Matzah and Pesach, these two celebrations, these two feasts, was that you were so overwhelmed with God's goodness, and now it's that time of year where you're bringing forth the harvest. Remember, these are farmers, these are planters, these are gatherers. So you're so grateful in this time of year for the harvest that God has brought forth that you bring the first fruits of that harvest into the tabernacle of God. Now, it was unfathomable that someone would not bring God the first fruit since he had provided both Pesach, redemption, and Matzah, sanctification. And again, some of this is very difficult to understand, but first fruits is somehow tied, is somehow tied in the New Testament when Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Do you remember that? Somehow it's tied to the idea that if you confess God and his provision of salvation and sanctification, that then Christ will confess you before the Father. What does that mean? Well, you and I then will become the first fruits, the firstborn from the dead. What that means, Jesus doesn't just pull that out of the air. He's trying to teach you, if you confess Christ, confess God's salvation, which is the Messiah Christ, if you confess God's salvation with your life, then he will confess you. In what way? He will not abandon you to the grave. There's a, there's, a, there's a correlation there that I can't quite figure out, that the natural result of someone who understands the provision of God is to give the first fruits. And because we give the first fruits, we then become the firstborn. 
Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, but we become the first fruits of Christ being the firstborn from the dead. We too are raised from the dead. Now, hold on, hold on now. It's okay. You're all right. You might have a little headache. Think of the headache that I have. Over 40,000 of you, that's all we're doing. Then come the summer fall feasts. And the summer fall feast after a short break is Shabbat. This is the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. We'll get into why it's called the Feast of Weeks, but basically Shavuot happens 50 days after Bikurim, actually after Passover, the first fruits. So let me put it to you like this. There is a, a close relationship in the Hebrew mind between when God gave the law on Mount Sinai and when God wrote his law on the hearts of man on the day of Pentecost. They're very closely related. And when we study the Feast of Pentecost, we're going to go into great detail. But for now, there were two harvests. The first harvest that we just talked about was a lesser grain. It was a barley harvest. But when you celebrate Shavuot 50 days later, now you move from barley into wheat. The difference between barley and wheat is that barley is a basic need. Wheat is a luxury. And so even in the Old Testament celebration of Shavuot, that then the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, the Bible's trying to tell us that God wants to do much more than just meet our basic needs. He wants to give us luxury. And what is that luxury? He wants to go beyond meeting our needs and to give us his presence, something that the Hebrews would have never thought possible. He is going, we are partakers of the divine nature of God himself. He's going to put his Holy Spirit in us. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, what did Jesus say? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. So we're going to go beyond just the feast of basic necessity into celebrating a feast whereby God gives us his divine nature where we, you've heard me say this before, we see things we've never seen, do things we've never done, feel things we've never felt. So we go from salvation to sanctification to first fruits to thanksgiving for God's provision to thanksgiving for God's luxuries going beyond basic need. And here's what I want you to know. Those are the only four I'm going to cover with a 40,000 foot view, and I'll show you why in a moment. I want you to notice something. Jesus died on Pesach, Passover. Jesus went into the tomb on Matzah. Remember, unleavened is without sin. Jesus goes into the tomb without sin. Jesus rose from the dead on Bikurim, or Bikurim, first fruits, and Jesus' Holy Spirit descends on Shavuot, Pentecost. Those four major events happened in the prime time of the first four biblical feasts. Now, you with me still? If you'll stay with me, come on, you can do this. It's just a 40,000 foot view. Don't think you have to understand everything now. But here's the point. If Revelation, in the view of the cyclical approach to Revelation, is correct, which most of you know is my view, then as these seven visions happen in the book of Revelation that describe the types of events that occur from the time Jesus established his kingdom until the time he returns, then that means that every vision in the book of Revelation, all seven of them, should end the same way. They should all end with trumpet sounding and judgment, and then the saints rewarded, and then the new heaven and new earth where God's dwelling places with men. Now, the reason that's important is these first four feasts have already been celebrated by Jesus. He's gone in as Passover. He's gone into the tomb as unleavened. He's risen from the dead at first fruits, and the Holy Spirit has descended on Shabbat. So the only three feasts left to be fulfilled by Christ is the trumpet of judgment, the saints rewarded, the new heaven and the new earth. Here's the beauty of it. Those final works of Jesus during the three final feasts, the three final feasts are Rosh Hashanah, guess what? It's the feast of trumpets and judgment. Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement, the saints will be rewarded. And Sukkot, the feast of tabernacles, which is where God will be with us. He will be our God. We will be his people and we will dwell in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, that's a jet tour through the feast. Imagine what awaits you in the next six weeks. Imagine what awaits us. 
But for now, right now, I want to concentrate on this one because it kind of gets our hearts ready for this. See, I think in order for us to get the most out of this, our hearts have to be right. We're about to deal with some pretty serious stuff. And if I'm going to read thousands of pages every week, you're going to listen. <laughs> and if I got to talk this fast and get this done, we're going to do this together. Because Rosh Hashanah is the feast that we're waiting on now. It is the Feast of Trumpets. And I want to tell you a little bit about it and then do something together very special this weekend. The Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah. By the way, Rosh Hashanah means New Year. Rosh Hashanah, even though it's year and my September, October, is actually the Jewish New Year. They worked in two different calendars, just like you and I work in the, uh, the calendar year and the fiscal year. They worked in the civil year and the lunar year. Rosh Hashanah is the first in the civil year, but the seventh in the lunar year. So it's our September, October. And Rosh Hashanah came. We're talking about the Old Testament Rosh Hashanah. We're looking forward to another Rosh Hashanah, but the Old Testament was a time you got very, very serious about sin and repentance. And I want to ask you to do that with me. A ram's horn would be blown. And for the next 10 days, you would have a connection between Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And in those 10 days, also called days of awe, you would repent, you would examine, and you would repent. When the Apostle Paul says, when you're taking communion, let a man examine himself, he doesn't pull that out of thin air. He's going back to the original Rosh Hashanah. We're having a feast in communion. Don't you dare take it, he said, without repentance and examination. And those 10 days that followed Rosh Hashanah leading to Yom Kippur, those days were high holy days in which the people would come together. Oh, I wish I had the time to paint this entire scenario. The people would come together and God would judge them. It's not the eternal judgment that is yet to come. This is the day in the Hebrew nation when God would hand out merits and discipline. In other words, it was a spiritual, a yearly spiritual checkup on the first day of the new year. Imagine us doing this. Imagine me coming out the first day of every new year and say, okay, time to repent of all our sins this past year. Write them down, give them to me. And then on the basis of how you lived your life, God would dispense either discipline or judgment. That's not very popular in the American church, is it? The gospel of grace does not void God's discipline in your life. It never has. Hebrews chapter 12, in the New Testament, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as son. So during Rosh Hashanah, God decides, amazing, who will be blessed in the coming year and who will be cursed on the basis of how they lived the year before. Now this Hebrew word cursing is kind of taken out of context. What it basically means is this. When you're in the family of God, God truly wants to bless you, but there are things you can do that will remove his favor. And do you know why? Because God is not an enabler. So on Rosh Hashanah, God decides who gets blessed, who gets cursed, who are those from whom God will remove his favor. Do you get plenty or famine? Do you get peace or war? Do you get sickness or health? So there's this celebration going on and feasting, but there's also this soberness of mind. How have I lived? Who am I? Do my actions warrant God's blessings? Or have I lived in such a way as to circumvent the favor of God? You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. So what happens now? What do we do from here? These seven biblical feasts are gonna tell us something paramount. And here's what it is. And it's what we've forgotten. Redemption and judgment are inextricably tied together. You cannot have one without the other. And sin is a serious issue. And you're gonna be warned to get serious about both. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder, you bring the wonder Today 
Today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.